Okay, so um, chapter six, nice, sweet, kind of short chapter. So the learning objectives, I guess, for this, are just if you don't have one already, is just to be <laughs> aware that the terminal exists. Um, I don't dive into like the IT and admin tools and stuff. Like, I guess it's kind of known that terminal is an admin tool, but also I say understand. Again, this is more like a basic awareness of the three programs which sit on top of the command line because. I think understanding the terminal and the shell, et cetera, you know, his book's worth of stuff. Um, and then we'll get a very, oh, I got a nice typo there, but we'll get a very brief um, look into customizing our terminals and our shells. So I don't have my monitors. Um, so I just want to point out this kind of funny hacky edit that I've done on the, on the thing here with the, um, the image. But basically uh, the three programs that Alex talks about in the book are the terminal, the shell, and the operating system. Um, I kind of like this little graph that he's put together. Um, we type our commands as humans. Uh, they go to the command line one way or another, and then they're interacted with, with the operating system. And you can see through the nodes that generally will open up a terminal. And then the stuff we type in the terminal goes to the shell, and then the shell reads those things we type and interacts with programs so on the operating system and um, yeah I, I i feel like i think the diagram kind of just explains everything um so i didn't feel there was too much to add here um but why should we learn to use the terminal um <laughs> it's like you kind of want to look cool right like I don't know if anyone remembers this from the Bond film. I think it's from Russia with Love. Um, there's this guy, Boris, the hacker, and he's like you know, typing 500 words a minute and he's interacting with the terminal and it looks pretty sweet. Um, I think that's why most of us want to learn the terminal. Um, yeah, Alex gives some, some recommendations. Um, I'm a Mac user as well. So I've actually just basically done the exact same thing Alex has done is I've always used the terminal, like the application that is just called terminal. Um, I've never used iTerm2. So that's something I'm going to look at when I get some spare time is like, what will that actually do? Um, how will it help me? If anyone does use that or has used that, feel free to jump in and yeah, talk about it. No. Yeah, um, and it, yeah, he says the same thing for Windows is essentially to just um, use use the default application. Um, I have never had any problems with them, so I didn't think there was room for any disagreement or whatever myself. Um, the shell, it gets maybe a little bit more interesting because um, as Alex says, there are a bunch of different um, shells you could choose. I also just use ZSH. Um, so I don't really know KSH and Fish. I did a few years back use one for Windows with this Git Bash. Um, I think it was or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, Alex says if you're a Windows user, uh, you have two choices. So you've got CMD or PowerShell. And unless you're kind of grandfathered in, I guess, or like you, you know, from some kind of legacy agreement you had or working a long time ago and you're really fluent and used to CMD, he recommends just use PowerShell. Um, but that was it. So I, I did, I just, at no point could I really see any point in going off the template in the book because it's kind of short and sweet. And I feel like if you've read the book, you'll get the point that Alex is making is like the terminal exists and there are some things you can do with it, like customize it. And probably the best way to do that is to just go in, follow a guide, like he says, or follow his instructions and then see what happens um, when you customize these things, whether you like any of the plugin managers or whether you don't. Um, but does anyone have anything to add? Maybe like a Windows user's perspective on PowerShell and CMD or anything? Yeah, yeah I could give uh, a thought here. So. I've been a Windows user for like, yeah, forever. 
<laughs> so yeah, so I'm, I'm try. I'm, I'm I worked with uh, Linux, of course, and um, now Windows are uh, offering like a subsystem. You could use Linux in Windows, so it's uh, you could use Bash in Bash commands in Windows. So if you, if you know Bash, you, you you would use it in Windows uh, in the command line. Um, so it's basically like you set up uh, a subsystem or image inside the, your the windows you just download like for example ubuntu or something and uh, in the command line you just type bash like the word bash and it will go into the subsystem bash and run it so and now you are inside the subsystem in windows itself so it's pretty cool thing so you can just run command line inside windows uh, Using Bash, not uh, not command prompt or PowerShell. Um, so I use that, and I also use um, uh, the one that uh, that Jack mentioned, which is uh, like I think it's called MingW or something like that, uh, which is Bash mm. or uh, packaged with Git or something like that. Um, uh, Git Bash is yeah, mm. Git Bash, yeah. yeah. And you could use uh, like this, the same commands and in, in, like uh, if you, if you inside the window, uh, Linux. So yeah, that's what I use in daily basis. Yeah, I've always used or not always, but recently at least I've been using uh, Git Bash. I didn't like. I, I always forget that um, WSL is there, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, I don't know. Either way. I have been using those though, the, the bash terminals within or bash shells <laughs> within Windows. Yeah. Um more just because then it's the same as any system. You know, it, it's it's bash, whether you're on Windows or Linux or Mac. For the most part, they're the same. So yeah. yeah. And I I also <laughs> use like uh, WSL because uh, when you we are contributing to open source packages, uh, some some of them are really really like optimized to work just on Linux system yeah. or something like that. So if you if you are a Windows user, it will be hard. It, it could be it, it, it uh, like, like you could like set up your environment, but it's very hard. So if you use like the WSL to set up your environment, it will be very like convenient. That's why I use it. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Has, has anyone used any of the plugin managers either? Because I am, um, I've always known these kind of things exist, but I've just always used the basic terminal, whatever I'm given. And I barely use the terminal, so no. <laughs> um, like, use I use, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just I, I, I pretty much I use the terminal from the tab in our studio most of the time, if I'm going to use the terminal at all, um, which is convenient because it um, mm. puts it into the directory of the, you know, the project that you have open. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm often too lazy to even click the terminal. So I <laughs> sy system brackets. Right. <laughs> and, and yeah, that's the other thing is I, I use um, various commands from R or like the FS package for a lot of the type of stuff that I would do from the terminal. Um, mm, so we, yeah, maybe I, what's FS package? Like what, is, uh, what function? File system is just uh, utilities yeah. for, you know, um, getting lists of files and uh, they, they have like a, um, is it dir map or LS map or something like that where it all, mm. it's just, um, yeah, dir map or it, you can do something to every file in a directory. Um, uh, little simple so things. Instead of using like list.files and like, um, like, I don't know, the star operator or something in patterns, like you use this package. Yeah, and it's pretty much like, I'm trying to see, uh, yeah, it's it basically is just doing, um, get the list of files with some, um, you know, you can have some uh, settings of what, you know, what types of files you want and that sort of thing. And then map 
everything in that list into some function. So um, I've used it for like bulk rename, although actually uh, I think there's a separate rename thing. Maybe not. Mm. Um, so like if I have some, uh, yeah, the, use this as a rename files uh, function that can actually be helpful for that. Um, yeah, see, yeah, I do that with, with map. I do, I think I just use per. Uh, right. So you totally can just do it with map. Um, it just combines a couple of things and it has some things built in to help you, you know, like if you want to uh, recurse through subdirectories and things like that, it, mm -hmm. um, dir map helps with that. So, yeah, um, and there was the, there was the one, I don't know if it's the same package actually, but it's the one that creates the visualization of your structure for you, like the tree-like structure. Mm. I is, is that FS? Mm. If it is, I don't know about that piece of S FS. <laughs> yeah, it's called cool. yeah, it's file system visualizer or something. I can't, I don't think I ever even downloaded the package. Mm. I just now you've said it, I kind of remember. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff could be quite useful if you want to like not use the terminal and use R to do this stuff, right? Um yeah, cool. Should I should I go on to SSH? I feel like that was a bit more sure. SSH is a little bit more um <laughs> it's a bit more interesting in a way. Um not to like dunk on the terminal or anything, but I think <laughs> the cool stuff about the terminal and the command line probably comes in like in chapter eight and chapter ten. Um yeah. so let's yeah, this will eventually fill in. Um okay, so the chapter is called Connecting Securely with SSH, which um, kind of gives away part of the first learning objective, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, learning objectives here are to understand what SSH is and why we use it. And I suppose also to like know what the uh, like what the acronym stands for. But we'll get to that. Um, we're going to find out the difference between a public key and a private key, and we want a kind of basic appreciation of how SSH encryption works. I think I was meant to add on another one here when I edited, when I came back this afternoon, but I, I can't even remember what it is now. So we'll see if we, <laughs> learn, if we learn something else. <laughs> um, okay, so SSH stands for um, Secure Shell, and I guess Alex put Secure, like the socket in brackets. I guess some people will even refer to that. Oh, that's its full name. Um, but I suppose Secure Shell just works. Um, and the idea here is that when you're, when you're interacting with a remote server, um, so when you're doing stuff on your own laptop or I don't know, um, some kind of notebook online or whatever, or however you're interacting with a server, you need to be able to communicate, i.e. send um, commands across to the server. And when you do that, you want to make sure that not just anyone can go do stuff on the server. So you, you want to prevent bad actors, right, from performing bad things. And it's so nothing... mean. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, I, he used to have a few good, fit, like Con Air and um, Face Off. So I, I was just kind of kidding, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. He is... No, that's this whole thing that he's like, he's a great bad actor. <laughs> like he can come across awful, but and he'll do something <laughs> like um, uh, uh, adaptation. Where I that was seen awesome. adaptation. Oh, so that one's really good. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching Nicholas, like I didn't mean it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you'll be um, one. I One thing I haven't put in the notes it's directly in the book is like you'll open up your terminal or have you going to do it from your computer and then once you start interacting with a server you're going to be using linux commands um so when we later get on to like the getting comfortable in the command line and the basics of linux is as when we'll get to know some of the commands um i'd say at that point it'd be really helpful to get like a nice cheat sheet up and if alex doesn't have one already he doesn't need to make one i'd say we could probably help him out find one pop it in um so there's there's a bunch of like easy to remember commands that are just really helpful um but okay so how do we actually achieve um like the secure connection uh which is 
we see the whole game. It's like what everything's about. And SSH works just by the exchanging of cryptographic keys. And these keys come in two parts. So they're public and they're private. And because of that, we call them public keys and private keys. Um, I do, I think I've got it on the next slide. Actually, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I need to source this image. So I, I need to go back and get the uh, reference because it's from a website. I just was really pressed for time. Um, but basically, your like the private key is two prime numbers, um, two very large prime numbers. And when you multiply those prime numbers, you get the public key. Um, so the public key by definition is not like a prime number, um, but it's the product of two primes. And the reason this can kind of, well, this, the reason this does work is that it's really hard to, if you, even if you know the public key, it takes a lot of computation um, to figure out which two primes uh, the public key is the product of. At the moment, um, Alex kind of references that, that once you get, I can't remember what the threshold is, but past a certain point, like past a certain number of digits, you're going to reach like at current computing speeds, the heat death of the universe before you solve most of these problems. Um, maybe like a can of worms. And I definitely don't know enough about it to talk about it, but there's the, the kind of chat, isn't there, that quantum computing is going to destroy this um, in that you can essentially do nearly an infinite amount of computations in different parallel universes or whatever and somehow communicate between them. And you try every combination and eventually you'll be able to get people's private, or you'll be able to use people's private keys. Um, Sounds kind of sci-fi and like scary and will probably maybe will never happen, but I imagine when it does, there will be like quantum cryptography or whatever um, that will perhaps work on similar ways. And I guess there's there's not going to be like an analytic solution found for getting the two primes, right? Um, but yeah, that, that's the idea is there's this relationship between um, two numbers, their product, and as long as you know the two, num two prime numbers and nobody else does, you can give out the public key um, as many times as you like. And uh, yeah, you can use your private key to interact with that server. Um, so when should you move your private key? Um, a little like mass joke here, um, but essentially you should never move your private key. Um, Storing it in two places, like I know a lot of people do things like they write down their cryptocurrency keys on paper or in their hard drive in like a Word doc and stuff, right? Which totally defeats the point of having <laughs> cryptographic things. And I sadly know a few people who've had their wallets um, kind of rinsed or whatever. Um, but yeah, never move your private key. It gets given to you in, in a nice secure location um, and just keep it there. But Alex um, points out that. The, the terminology of calling something a public key and something else a private key um, kind of is confusing. Um, and I always think of sensitivity and specificity when I think, when, I, when these kind of things come up. Um, it's much more helpful, or I think it would probably be much more helpful, as Alex says, to think of the private keys as the keys and the public keys as the locks. And like the image kind of hints at, there's one private key, but there could be many public keys. Um, so don't make a copy. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It, it's it kind of like, it's kind of baffling that someone would take their private key and then start duplicating it, right? Um, especially if it's important, but I suppose uh, people do. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the important idea is that your private key is a key and your public key is a lot. And then, well, does anyone want to like jump in here? Um, do they have any like mental models or anything that they found helpful for this kind of thing? No? Okay, so we are essentially at the end. Um, but yeah, what... 
Alex has a nice section in the book and it's definitely, I didn't just want to like copy and paste the book, but I feel like the headlines of what happens are maybe useful and everyone should just go back and read the book if they ever want to like get further into this. Um, but the, the like checklist or the procedure is kind of the keys are created. You got your private key, your public keys. Um, public keys are then added to a hidden file called .ssh slash authorize underscore keys, um, which, you know, the file name is well named. It's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, those public keys are then shared with the server admin. And yeah, if you are the server admin, then those keys are shared with you. Um, the keys come with a name. So Alex uses the example ID underscore, et cetera. Um, and he says, there's probably no real reason to ever change this name. Just use the name as it is. Um, he does say that you can kind of work around that with the, I guess, what would you call this? Like dash I, but that all the different, you know, uh, command line things like dash V is, is one of those. Um, and yeah, I feel like we're so fast to the end, but I, I really couldn't think of too much more to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, when when you're when you're dealing with like SSH, you can to make your life a little bit easier. You can make a config file wherein you can store your username or your email address, presumably a bunch of other things, and then save yourself some some precious time typing. And I think I, I really love like snippets in our studio and little things that I can do to save myself <laughs> typing all the time. Um, so definitely seems like it's worth doing. And yeah, the, I'll, I'll leave <laughs> these open to the floor. These are comprehension questions from Alex. Um, yeah. And under what circumstances should you move or share your <laughs> SSH private key? Never. Yeah. Hard drive failure, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I suppose, I don't know if it, did I, I don't know if I missed any sections or anything. I don't know. Oh, I mean, I didn't miss any sections, but is there like a potential situation where you are now like transporting ownership of something to someone else and you should share your SSH private key? Presumably the person would then make another one. Um, I don't really know how that would work. Like, when the gatekeeper changes, is there any, yeah. what's the procedure? I I think I would still just like attach, uh, set up a different user that they have their own keys and then mm -hmm. you give, you know, admin access to that user. So, so it still isn't really mm -hmm. sharing um, a private key, so. Yeah, you just transfer the privileges. Um, yeah. And then they you don't know their key, they don't know yours. Yeah. So yeah, never, never move or share your SSH <laughs> private key. Um and yeah, what is it about SSH public keys that makes them safe to share? Uh, it can feel I guess no math. one wants to yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can, it can fit. No one wants to say it because it's so obvious. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's like you can't, it's not as easy to, well, it's really hard to go from the output back to the input. And so I like hashing works. Um, so yeah, like that's it. I thought it was, so I think I, I always see the term SSH and I couldn't have told you what it stands for today. And I essentially knew how hashing worked, but I didn't know the exact hashing of, um, so like this SSH, like, um, so it's good. It was nice to get these things on board. Like, I think knowing the difference between a private and public key and having that nice explanatory men mental model of like the private key is a key and the public key is a lock is really good. So I do think this yeah. chapter is like pretty valuable. Um, just maybe for a book club, it doesn't have too much like, like weight to it that we can really like get involved with and dig stuff out for yeah so i i feel like six and seven are probably over divided like keeping those together probably would have been fine but then i think the problem was that eight is pretty meaty and so he didn't mm -hmm. want to have 
six, seven, and eight as one chapter. Um, and I mean, I don't know, I can kind of see that, you know, six is a different thing and then seven is a different thing. There's not that much to say about them. <laughs> um, so I think we've got a lot more coming uh, week after next with chapter eight, but it was good to have this baseline to make sure that we're ready for chapter eight, basically. Um, mm. And if, if someone didn't know, I'd never heard of these things before. They need to have them introduced, right? Um, right. So, um, yeah. And yeah, just I don't know. It's it's good to to have uh, have someone say things. A lot of this stuff is stuff that I've, you know, a lot like a lot of this book is stuff that no one really ever taught me. I just kind of figured it out. And so, having someone say things <laughs> is actually pretty mm -hmm. useful, you know. <laughs> okay yeah definitely <laughs> and as well like we've all got probably gaps different weird gaps in our knowledge right like if you're writing this book you don't know where any individual's gaps are right. or where everyone tends to have so like i think it's yeah i think it fits in the book um <laughs> nicely for sure i don't I, i'm trying to think like because i wasn't sure too sure what comes in eight and ten I, I was thinking whether like whether I was going to do the cheat sheet in the terminal chapter, like number six, right? Like different commands right. and stuff. Um, but I don't, I don't know if like, I guess a question or a, a thought Alex is going to have is like, is there anything you guys think wasn't in here that, that could have been in these two parts? Um, but yeah. I, I don't know if I don't know if I got anything. I think with chapter six standing on its own as a chapter, I would go into more detail about the different options, but then it gets to be such a mess because, you know, that explodes out because he wants to talk about different uh, operating systems and what uh, shell op terminal slash shell options you have on those different operating systems. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe some, um, I don't know, like tips from a pro of like really helpful customizations, like or plugins. Yeah. I know he does like point us towards some, but if if he were worried that an editor's just gonna say, well, that chapter's so short, like let's not do it to flesh it out, maybe just some like, I don't know, best practices, great plugins, visual examples of like what it looks like if you don't have them, what it looks like if you do. Because to be honest, if I had more time, that's what I would have done is I would have added these plugins to my terminal and gone and got some mm. some extra things about them um so he'd probably be completely in his like rights to say well you you should do that uh, as the user right. you should go out and explore that stuff um but but i think going into some of the things um like showing an example of uh showing git status on your command line um, i have that set up in our studio in the r command line and i do find that very helpful um so like walking through that kind of thing and showing I don't know. I, I mm. suspect that these, like, especially the Windows tabs, like he just needs to get, <laughs> like he hasn't, he doesn't work on Windows. So he doesn't mm -hmm. know the answer to these things and he needs to do more work to fill them out. Um. So I, I, I just, I expect that there probably will be more about that. Um. I don't know if he has any uh, issues. Like he, uh, yeah, I mean, he has 62 issues um of the different things he wants to do and most of them are just titles if you look at yeah they i don't know if any of them have a description they're just uh here's a task that i need to do <laughs> um so i, I reckon i would yeah. have liked to have helped him out on this one um <laughs> to give him some more content and yeah i i don't know i think it I don't want to repeat myself. I think it's helpful yeah. and it's yeah, has a good it, has a good place. It serves its purpose. Um, and then, like I said, next or the next meeting, uh, chapter eight is much, much, much more information. Um, it's kind of it's like really funny looking at these, two, you know, six and seven. There's you know one you barely have to scroll to read the chapter, and then eight is. <laughs> Yeah, quite a bit more. I can't, I'm not sure how many pages it'll be in a print book, but it's a lot more than mm -hmm. six and seven combined. 
Um, so yeah, we'll do we'll do that eight, and then we'll continue on with the um, AWS stuff. All right, that's all yeah, I. Have. So yeah, I don't have any more questions or anything about this one. So I think uh, let's end early. Yeah, get the time back. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I'll miss your your presentation, Gus. Um, <laughs> I will. Okay. I'll catch up via via VOD. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Bye. Later. See you guys.